thanks for watching. This video is about a single board computer I call POC, which means proof of concept. It's powered by the Western Design Center 65C816 microprocessor, which is in a PLCC44 package. Next to it is a 128K static RAM. Next to the RAM is a 32K EEPROM. You're now looking at the SCSI host adapter, which powers an 8-bit or narrow SCSI bus. Below it, and not visible, is a dual-channel UART, which powers two serial ports, RS-232. The silver cable is connected to a console, which is the terminal. And the yellow cable is an interface to a Unix software development system, which allows the transfer of files from the server over to POC. POC is powered by an ATX power supply which was salvaged from an old computer. The serial bus includes a CD-ROM, a DDS2 tape drive, and on the very top a 73 gigabyte SCSI hard drive. Now bear with me while I set up the camera so you can watch the screen as I power up the system and, you, and it goes through the boot. At power on, POC goes through the same steps that a modern personal computer does. It starts by doing a test of critical memory areas. It looks at the default hardware stack. It looks at zero page, and it also looks at an area of RAM, which eventually will be the hardware stack once the system is booted. Having determined that those areas of memory are intact and functioning, it then produces a power on screen, a banner screen and then cycles through memory testing the entire range of memory and if all memory is good it then attempts to connect to the SCSI subsystem and bring up an operating system. Since the picture is worth many thousands of words let me power up POC and you can watch what happens. At this point, POC has gone through the entire boot process, but it's unable to load an operating system because one doesn't actually exist. So by default, it enters the machine language monitor, which it did so at, uh, in the, the master boot code. As you can see, the monitor displays a register dump upon entry and reading from left to right. We see the program bank register, followed by the program counter. Next we see the status register which is displayed in bitwise format so you can determine which flag is set and which flag is cleared. Next we see the C register which is the com a combination of the A and B accumulators. It's displayed as a 16-bit register. And the X register also displayed as a 16-bit register. And the Y register. Next to that is the 16-bit stack pointer, which currently is at the top of the stack at CDFF. And then we have the, the direct page zero register, direct page pointer register, whatever you might want to call it, followed by the data bank register. And lastly, the IRQ vector, which is actually a vector in RAM. That's not part of the uh, 65C816 hardware, but it's something I added to the monitor so I can see where that is pointing. Now, lacking an operating system, the monitor has control. So if I type commands to the monitor, it will do whatever it is I ask it to do, and then it will display a prompt again. Let me start out by clearing the screen. Alright, now let me do a simple memory dump. I'll dump some memory starting at 0400, which is where the 
boot image from the hard drive is loaded. The memory dump dumps 256 bytes or one page at a time. If I continue and dump, uh, just type another memory dump, the address pointer is maintained and it continues into the next page and the next page and so on. And as you can see as we got into those last two pages we're seeing some text which is part of the boot block which is actually a 1K block on the hard drive. Now this monitor also has the ability to assemble and disassemble code. Now let's take a look at that boot image again. The first and second byte at the start of the boot image points to the actual boot machine code which is at 460. So if I disassemble that range I should see some machine instructions. And I do. As you can see, this disassembly is somewhat like you would see with most 6502 type machine language monitors. The difference being is that since it's written to operate the 65C816 in native mode, it actually can display up to four bytes per disassembled instruction, one for the opcode itself and the other three for the operand. Uh, none of those four byte instructions exist in this part of the code, but I'll artificially assemble some code and show you what it looks like. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clear memory. In most 6502 machine monitors, the F command clears memory. So if you say fill, then you give it in a memory uh, memory address range. You can fill it with a byte. So I'm going to fill everything from 150 to CFFF, and I'm going to fill it with zeros. Now on most machines, this probably would take quite a bit of while of time. As you'll see, however, with the 65C816, it goes quite rapidly. It's done. All right. Just to show you that it didn't clear it, let me dump some of that memory. Nothing but a bunch of zeros. All right, I'll halt it with a control C. Okay. Now, I'm going to assemble one instruction at address 2000 just to show you that I can assemble uh, full 24-bit address instructions. As you can see, I made a mistake there. I typed in a larger operand than the instruction can accept. It should have been STA, A, B, C, D, E, F, comma, X. There we go. The monitor knows the entire 65C816 instruction set, so it can assemble instructions such as PER1234 or PEI12 or PEA, etc. Also understands all those stack instructions that are so useful. Oops. Helps to use the comma, huh? like so. All right, in addition to these instructions, there are instructions for hunting through memory looking for patterns which can be done either with ASCII or, or uh, actual byte values. Um, it's possible to modify memory. For example, if I want to modify the memory of 3000, I would type a greater than 3000, whatever that address it might be, and I can enter bytes. Or I can also do this. I can do 3000 up to maximum of 32 bytes. As you can see, it puts those uh, that uh, character string in a series of bytes, like so.
so. All right. The monitor also contains some commands for controlling the SCSI subsystem. Now this is a very primitive interface. Uh, it expects that you know what you're doing and if you don't know what you're doing you can uh, blow away data on disks and so forth. But just to give you an example, I'm going to load a block from the hard drive into memory and then I'm going to execute the code that's within. Now the load command takes the form of a read instruction like this and the exclamation point or the bang as it's sometimes referred to tells the monitor that this is going to be a SCSI command and all SCSI devices have a, a device ID and a logical unit number and those are the first two things entered so the drive is zero and has logical unit zero alright I'm going to address it by logical block address and I'm going to happen to use block address 100,000, that's 100,000 in hex, not in decimal. I'm going to load three blocks and I'm going to deposit them in memory at C1000. It's that fast. I'll do that again. I'll, sh I'll hold the camera by the busy light on the, uh, the uh, front of the hard drive so you can see just how quickly it reacts to the command. Okay, are you ready? That little flicker you saw, that was the hard drive being accessed by the by the computer. It's that quick. Now in addition to controlling the hard drive, I can also control the tape drive or the CD-ROM. I'm not going to do that right now because there's really nothing of interest on them. Now I said I was going to execute the code that I loaded at C1000. So the command to execute the code is the letter G for go and the address. And it tells me that it reads the clock inside the computer. That's the uh, real time clock. And it also gives me the uptime. It's been nine minutes since I booted the POC. And when it's done, it returns back to the monitor. Now, in addition to the G command for going to a routine and running it, you can also use J, which is jump to the routine as a subroutine, and an RTS takes you back to the monitor. So it's possible to test subroutines, and upon return, just like with the go command, you get a register dump, and so forth. Well, that's all for now. Hope you enjoyed watching this, and I hope I wasn't too lengthy. Thank you.